Welcome everyone to today's webinar hosted by the Division of Extended Education at the University of Manitoba. I am Karen Walschuk and I will be your host for this event. Before, in just a moment, we'll kick off our homecoming 2024 webinar, The Futures of Education, Ed Equity, Inclusion and Lifelong Learning. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabek, the Ininuuk, the Unsinunuuk, the Dakota Oyete, and Dene, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. For our audience today, thank you so much for joining us. Should you have any questions for our panelists, we ask that you use the Q&A function to submit your questions. I'd now like to introduce our speakers. Our moderator for today is Dr. Uta Kota, Dean of the Division of Education since Division of Extended Education, pardon me, since March 2024. She was raised, studied, and completed her PhD in Germany before joining the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, where she established an active biochemistry research program and where she received the Distinguished Teaching Award and was named Teaching Chair. In 2021, Dr. Kota joined the University of Manitoba as head of the chemistry department. Throughout her career, Dr. Kota has demonstrated a commitment to teaching, learning, and professional development. As the Dean of the Division of Extended Education, Dr. Kota is combining her interests in innovative and impactful education and compassionate leadership. Next, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. First off is Robin Addis, Product, Project Lead, University of Manitoba Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, Accessibility Credential. Since June 2023, Robin has been seconded to the Division of Extended Education to lead the development, launch, and first offerings of EDIA programming for staff, faculty, and students at the University of Manitoba. She works as an educational developer focused on equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility at the Center for the Advancement of Teaching and Learning at the University of Manitoba. Prior to her shift to educational development, Robin was a full-time faculty member in music theory and maintains an active research agenda focused on decolonial and anti-racist music theory pedagogies and practices. Robin holds an MA and PhD in music theory from the University of British Columbia and a Bachelor of Music degree from Queen's University. Next, I'd like to introduce Carlos Miranda Garcia, personal counsel for the Access and Aboriginal Focus programs within extended education. Carlos is a registered social worker. He's worked with a diverse population in various community programs in Manitoba and Alberta, including crisis services, specialized education support, mental health, and brain injury. Carlos is passionate and committed to providing services from a cross-cultural and holistic lens. Carlos holds a Master's of Social Work Clinical and a Bachelor of Science in Psychology degree. Next, I'd like to introduce Vicki Hatt, Instructor, Academic Language Support with Extended Education. Vicki has been a dedicated instructor at the University of Manitoba, focusing on enhancing the academic experience of international students for over 13 years. In her role, Vicki designs and delivers workshops tailored to address the specific challenges faced by students from diverse backgrounds. Her work focuses on the successful integration and support of international students using a holistic approach to help them navigate the complexities of academic and cultural life. Vicki is actively involved in promoting academic integrity, EDIA, and Indigenous information in her workshops and other initiatives in extended education. Lastly, it's my pleasure to welcome Ogadima Unike, graduate of the Applied Business Management Program here in Extended Education. Two years ago, Ogadima moved to Canada, where she not only furthered her education, but also navigated the challenges faced by new students and newcomers. Her journey has given her a deep understanding of the experiences of those transitioning to a new country, and she actively shares her insights to help others. 
Ogedima began her career in 2008 as a marine engineer with Shell and transitioned to charter administration and contract management with Nigeria LNG Limited before coming to Canada. She's an accomplished professional with a diverse background in the maritime, energy, nonprofit, and government sectors. She has a passion for service and regularly volunteers her time and shares her skills to empower others, reflecting her belief in making a positive Im impact. Ogadima holds a national diploma from the Marine, pardon me, the Maritime Academy of Nigeria, a higher national diploma in marine engineering from Southampton Solent University, UK, an MBA in shipping and logistics from Middlesex University, UK, and a certificate in management and administration from the University of Manitoba. We are so pleased to have you all here today to join us, and I'd like to now pass it over to Dr. Kota to start today's conversation. Thank you, Karen, for the very kind introduction. And welcome, everybody. We are so happy that you're joining us today for a topic that is close to our heart and, as we think, important, literally for the future of our planet. So today's webinar is about the futures of education. And the first question I always get is, really many futures? And yes, many futures. Because the concept of future of education was created by UNESCO, and it really refers to the concept of evolution of education into many different types of educations that are needed. And why is education so important? Why is the future of education so important? I think we can all agree that education is a key approach to address the changing needs of our societies, especially as we are living in a rapidly changing world. And to just name a few keywords that you will all be familiar with, we have geopolitical tensions, climate change, large-scale migration, economic instabilities, and all of those require smart responses, global responses, and therefore we need futures of education because our education systems themselves must change in order to be ready to tackle these challenges of the future. And so really it's about adapting education systems. As you also know from the title when you signed up for this webinar, we specifically want to focus today on lifelong learning, equity and inclusion, because the futures of education will not be successful if they do not full-heartedly incorporate these critical elements of lifelong learning, equity and inclusion. We really need to empower all learners and break down the barriers towards education in order to tackle tomorrow's problems. Lifelong learning um, really equips individuals with the skills, knowledge, and mindsets that are necessary to adapt and to seek succeed in this changing world. And um, therefore, it is crucial that everybody has access to lifelong learning and that we prioritize equity and inclusion. Um, so therefore, I look forward to hearing from the panelists today who bring a lot of different types of experiences to address this really global, global issue um, and establishing powerful futures of education. And I will not talk any further, but I look forward to hearing from our panelists. So to begin, I'd like to ask each of you to very briefly introduce yourself in your own words. Thank you, Karen, for already giving us sort of the official introduction. And then share with us what aspect of the future of education resonates with you. So in other words, why are you part of this panel and what is what is close and important to you? And um, we all know that education is really always beginning with the learner in mind. And today, Ogadima is a very successful professional, but we are proud that she's always so an alumni of our programs. And so I'd like to ask Ogadima first to introduce yourself and share with you what resonates about futures of education with you. Thank you so much, Ute. My name is Ogadima, and I am very pleased to be one of the panelists today. Um, no one will ever be too old to learn. Uh, I've learned that over the years and uh, it has come to uh, be a way of life for me. So I remember after my MBA, my dad said, oh, finally, now it's time for you to rest and do some fun things. So imagine the look on my dad's face when I told him I was going to Canada to study further. He said, what? Various potentials are unlocked at different stages in our lives. So at each stage, you need to 
keep yourself abreast with what is happening, rejuvenate yourself for the future. And we need to constantly embrace the lifelong learning just so as to harness that dormant potential. We have so much potentials in us. And if we can harness those potentials, uh, well, we will be able to achieve our desired goals, academically, of course, and career-wise. Quality education sets that foundation to unlocking those great potentials and building our desired future. A lot is changing environmentally, socially, to technologically and otherwise. But the thing is, there is need for each and every one of us to constantly improve ourselves. And we also need that kind of education system that will keep up with the pace of this fast changing nature. And we are happy that the likes of extended education has embraced this and provided this flexible education system, which is suitable for me. It was so suitable for uh, my own stage at that time. And it is also suitable for all stages in life while still allowing you to work and be self-reliant. And that is my own, the way I see um, long, uh, lifelong learning. It is for us to continuously improve ourselves to a desired future that we are working towards. Thank you, Ute. Thank you, Agradima. It's, it's wonderful to hear how, how you have embraced lifelong learning in your own life and are living it. Um, and next, I want to ask Robin, what resonates for you about futures of education and what in your experience brought you to be part of this panel? Thanks, Ute. Yeah, so my name is Robin Addis. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and as Karen mentioned in the introduction, I'm an equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility facilitator, um, currently working with the Division of Extended Education and the Office of Equity Transformation. But I've also, for my whole life, been involved in teaching in some way, whether that was in my childhood, playing with friends and being the teacher in front of the kids in the classroom, or, you know, through university experiences and as a faculty member, and now in a sort of support staff role. Um, and I really love this concept of futures of education, because for me, it resonates with my personal teaching philosophy, but also the needs of inclusive and equitable pedagogies. Um, focusing on educational futures really means committing to continuous change, learning and growth. Um, and I like the way that Ogadima kind of framed that as something that we do as individuals, but also, you know, society, um, the global environment, all of those things, there's always this continuous need for change. And the need to anticipate what future needs could be, whether that's for learners, for instructors, or for societies. Um, and for me, that, that need for change is really uh, an inspiring thing rather than something to be feared, um, because I'm always recognizing as a facilitator and instructor that every learner is unique and that the content and the approaches will always need to change depending on the context that I'm in, that learners are in, um, the kind of identities that we bring into whatever learning environment we're together within. Um, and I find for me that uh, that's especially important in equity and inclusion specifically because we know that societies, cultures, and individuals are always evolving, and because EDIA is always about reflecting on where are the inequities at, in the present, what's happened in the past, and how can we work together to change things for the future. So that future-oriented aspect of educational futures really appeals to me for all of those different reasons. Thank you, Robin. And I, I really like how you frame change as positive, right? Change as a powerful way to deal with the future. So thanks for that, that approach. Um, Carlos, I have you next on my list of asking whether you can introduce yourself and share what resonates about the futures of education with you. Sure, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to this afternoon. And I'd like to just start by sharing that I come from a small quarter, corner of Turtle Island called El Salvador. And my family settled in Winnipeg a while back, and I've lived here most of my life. So a lot of what you're going to hear me talk about is going to be rooted in my own experiences of living in and adapting to different cultures, but also in this sense of just learning in different ways and being able to shift gears and being able to experience being in different environments. So when I think about lifelong learning, uh, much like everybody must say, like, I think it's never too late, you're never too old. I think um, I look beyond just the academic expectations and more about the commitment to that personal 
and professional growth that is achieved by holistic balance. And I want to talk a little bit about my approach, or just the approach to the work that I do is both cross-cultural and holistic and embedded in an access program, the longest running at the University of Manitoba, has it's really quite the legacy that we have. So I wanted to just say, share a little bit of why, why I think this is important and why it relates, because cross-cultural cross -cultural approach allows us to see how we influence the world by taking on that approach. It takes away from seeing the students as a homogeneous group and recognizing the diversity that, that is there. So for example, in the access program, we serve 85% indigenous students and uh, the rest would be non-indigenous, predominantly newcomers. But you can have a lot of different overlapping identities within the group. You can have an 18 year old student coming from a Northern community. You can have a 20 year old, uh, 24 year old Métis student from Winnipeg and a 40 year old uh, newcomer that's coming from a different region. All part of the same program, all but we can look at the different stories and the parallels in how they're trying to adapt, transition, and look at their education. I also think holistic is important because we, it allows us to explore the different areas of who we are and ourselves. And the meaning of holistic for me is to write in this program. It comes from indigenous knowledges, and we define it as heart, mind, body, and spirit. And I do recognize that other indigenous groups might change the order of those, but I am honoring the teachings that I've received in the program that I work for. So for me, promoting this holistic balance amongst faculty, staff, and students is great because it gives us all an opportunity to look at the blind spots. And in this setting, in a, in a university setting, it's so, it's so too easy to focus so much on the mental and physical aspects of ourselves. But we, and that could be detrimental. And EDIA courses can help us look beyond and can help us look at some of those blind spots and almost explore those uncharted territories. And we can model as, as professionals and as staff that are still continuing in our own journeys, what it's like to be committed to our education. And we can model that to our students who can also see this professional development as a way of learning and as a way of being integrated into their own healing as well. And recognize that it's just beyond degrees and degree programs, but there's always an opportunity to explore in different ways. So that's what I'd like to say for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. I really appreciate how you remind us of the diversity of our learners and that we really need holistic approaches and the plural of approaches and the plural of futures of education to support all of our learners as they are instead of molding them all into one size fits all. So thank you for sharing that. And I look forward to exploring that more today. So Vicky, thank you for waiting patiently. We are now very curious to hear from you what you brought you to this panel and what resonates about the Futures of Education with you. Hi there, my name is Vicky Hatt. And um, as mentioned, I'm an instructor at Extended Ed. I've been there for 13 years working with adult international learners, de uh, designing and delivering a series of nine workshops over the one year that they're with us. And those workshops have adapted a lot over the years. Um, and more and more now as we adopt more EDIA policies and Indigenous perspectives into our course content and the student experience. So uh, what resonates with me is that empathy has become a big part of the future of education in there. And that's where I see myself in there as well, where our policies for international students um, maybe need some more equity in there. We need to look at them as individuals again, not just what uh, international students are looking for, but as humans. Um, and so I focus on my own education in those areas, um, uh, the EDIA opportunities throughout the university, lots of opportunities throughout Extended Ed and the U of M to learn about Indigenous perspectives and working closely with our elder in residence, Grandfather Wambidi Wakita, to incorporate um, and include those Indigenous perspectives and ways of learning into the workshops that I'm able to deliver to the students. Um, also, work closely with instructors. Um, our instructors are also lifelong learners. Um, and so by showing my own learning and the learning of our instructors, we can show our students that we're also as involved in that uh, process as well. And um, having them join um, different initiatives that I've uh, been working on, and I'll be sharing some of those initiatives today. Thank you, Vicky. Yes. 
empathy is so important and it's a, it's a core concept of the future of education. So I, I look forward to hearing more from you, how you practically implement that in your work. So before we dive into our panel discussion in, in all great detail, I wanted to share a little bit more with, with all of our attendees um, what UNESCO has set out as the, the pillars of the future of education. So as I said already, it's a concept of evolving education to adapt to the needs of, of a rapidly changing world. And this was published in 2021 by a, a formal report by UNESCO, which is a very influential and I'll share the link later in the chat with everybody who is, is interested. So it's a report on the futures of education. And um, importantly, UNESCO describes the aim of the futures of education as follow. So the aim is to build a new social contract for education grounded on principles of human rights, social justice, human dignity, and cultural diversity. And so these are all the keywords we, we want to address today, but it really stresses the concept of education being a social contract, um, a, 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 where we reach an understanding in society of the importance of education for everything that we do. So education is being the ground, the fabric that connects us in, in all of our work and that is needed to address all of our problems. So it's really, um, that's what's meant with social contract. And principles are uh, grounded in the principle of human rights. And of course, as we know, key human rights principles are equity and inclusion. And equity, not in the sense of making everybody equal, but really providing equitable access that is tailored to the individual, their, their needs, their abilities, and removing barriers to education. And this is, will be a very big topic today because we have to start with equity to create barrier-free accesses to education to then subsequently and create inclusive spaces where everybody feels welcome, which is equally important and will be a big, big another topic today. Um, furthermore, UNESCO really stresses in their Futures of Education report, the right to quality education throughout life. And this is important because the right to education exists. That's a, a relatively established concept nowadays. We all remember in the past, it was not normal for kids to go to school nowadays in most areas of the world. Thankfully it is, but often when we think about education, we think about educating children, youth, and maybe young adults. But as Ogadima nicely reminded us today, and I really appreciated your passion there, it doesn't end with a post-secondary or secondary education. Education nowadays has to be lifelong because our world changes too quickly. We cannot stop, us adults, we have to continue learning. And therefore it's very important that UNESCO reaffirms the right to lifelong education, which includes adult education. And um, this is something we need because if we do not consider adult education, we won't be ready for the futures. And so maybe with that, a little bit of, of theoretical background, I would like to dive into some questions to the panels to see what does it really mean? And so, um, Let's start with the concept of uh, diversification. We always talk about it nowadays, right? That uh, we have to diversify our spaces, we have to be open, we have to remove barriers so that we have diverse learners, diverse workers, diverse colleagues. But why is this important? And I'd like to ask Agadima what why she thinks diversification is important and what it means specifically for education. Uh, thanks a lot, Ute. So the important, if you have been in Canada for more than two weeks, you will understand that the importance of diversification can never be overemphasized, especially in a country like Canada. You come into the classroom and all shades of colors are in your classroom, you know, right? That's the first thing that, um, you know, you see. And I love how diversified we all are in appearance, in culture, in, in our perspectives, because everyone comes from all over the world and we are in this one room and you know you want to see how you can align it. And the only way you can align our thoughts and get us to understand what you're teaching is when you are able to make your education system that diversified. So the emphasis 
we need to offer variety of learning approaches. So you offer variety of learning approaches. You are able to accommodate the different perspectives and give the opportunity to meet the diverse needs of each of the students. So that is the key importance. So I watch my le uh, lecturers each time they're trying to get this different and diverse understanding from the different students. And I see them trying to harmonize it so that everyone is on the same page. So you need that kind of approach. You cannot be, you cannot sh shut down that aspect else you're not going to have a functional education system that is addressing the core needs of the students. So that is what I love most. This does not only, of course, foster inclusivity, but it addresses different learning styles. We all come with different abilities. So, and it also promotes critical thinking in the classroom. So when you're judging, it you're harmonizing all those different aspects you are able to drive down how you can pass the learning to the to, uh, to the students i love the way the instructors try to blend the broad understanding and different perspectives i just enjoy that and it prepares us not only for um to be able to pass exams but you are preparing us to the very complex multicultural workplace that we will experience in Canada. So, and even in the global environment. So when you're able to adapt to that, learn effectively in the classroom with that mindset, you ease in seamlessly and effortlessly into the workplace. So that is the key importance. We all work hand in hand to achieve that common goal of a balanced education system that helps us build a greater and sustainable future. Yeah. Thank you, Yute. <laughs> Thank you, Agadima. I, I really appreciate how you stressed that diverse classrooms, you're not only learning about a topic, but in the end, you learn from each other, right? And that's yeah. so important because it's the same. Mm -hmm. it, it shows up in the workforce, it shows up in our private lives and, we all can only develop cross-cultural competence if we practice it. And in the classroom is the space to practice it in, in an encouraging and safe way. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you had good experiences with your instructors. Yeah. We'll have to hear from our colleagues here on the panel how, how they do this. Um, but it's more than learning. And that's, I, that's why I wanted to turn to Carlos, because you mentioned in, in your introduction that it's really about holistic support and seeing an individual beyond their academic career. And so I was hoping that you could speak a little bit what we need to consider when we say we want to holistically support each person in lifelong learning. Sure, thank you. Um, so I, I think it's important to look at what comes to mind is connection to self and connection to community. Because in a fast moving place, it, it's very easy to feel very, very fragmented and being pulled in different directions. And what I've learned a lot and where I value a lot about working for a program that is deep, deeply rich in indigenous knowledge is, is seeing the interconnectedness in all things and understanding that as a central, as an essential part in our learning and in exploring new things. Uh, there, I think it's also because we're talking about holism, there's an invitation to look at different self aspects, heart, mind, body, and spirit. And that's, this helps us to shift gears between the two. And that shifting of gears can lead to other commitments, can lead to other possibilities and other ways of exploring things. As an elder once described it to me, she said, it's, it's like a wheel that has to constantly keep on turning. And as it turns, it allows us to move and it's important to not get stuck in one, play, in one place. And that has always, I've always remembered that and the importance of, of moving forward. And I, I think about EDIA as a framework that allows us, when I look at holism, I, I think EDA allows us to have a framework to explore these different questions, to reflect on these different questions and ways of, of moving forward. But because the question was also about considerations, I like to say four, you know, one of them would be creating wraparound supports or looking for partnerships that provide those wraparound supports because those are very essential. Recognizing that there are different pathways to healing having flexibility and having a commitment to funding. So I'm gonna go back to each of them and just say a little bit more. And what I mean by wraparound supports, for example, in the context of access, we have a grandfather in residence, we have academic specialists, 
We have a case manager. We have counselors and advising that are, we're here to maintain a long historical legacy of knowledge that has been passed down and following a particular way that's almost like scaffolding for the students as they, as they come into their journey. So it doesn't matter whether you're 18 years old, whether you're 25 or whether you're 65, the scaffolding is here and it's here for a reason because we recognize that there are different ways that you come into. There are different reasons as to why you might be here at different points of your life. And it allows us to help people more holistically, to be more proactive in how we respond to things. And I think about one example, you know, a lot, a lot of the times we don't think about what shows up in the classroom. And I'll remember this one case where we had someone that was struggling, potentially becoming homeless, but because no one would know that if that person just shows up to a classroom. But because we had this system of wraparound support, you could have a case manager act, act quickly to help connect to resources. You could have the advisors come in and help out with the pieces, counseling, and also the, the cultural and spiritual supports that, that were needed to help this person through. The other point about coming back to the different parts of healing or different uh, ways of healing, it challenges this idea that one method fits all. And the Mental Health Commission of Canada has been very clear on that in different reports that we need to be working in different ways, specifically when we're looking at Indigenous peoples and newcomers and workers on the ground, especially those of the BIPOC community. So by BIPOC, you know, we use the terms a lot, but it's Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color, and students themselves who have said that, that, and I reflect on my experience as a counselor when they tell me, if I go to something that feels limiting, it doesn't actually help with what I'm looking for. And I think the same can be said for when we're looking at other forms of teaching as well. And now I look at flexibility, and in the context of access, this means not having these limitations to say you only have this number of sessions or you, you're not allowed to come in after you've dealt with a particular thing. I've heard a lot from our students about imposter syndrome. I've heard a lot about having significant doubts and thinking that maybe they don't belong here and maybe they're not going to continue their education. But it's by having this kind of scaffolding and this promotion of holistic work that a person can recognize that this is where they belong. This is where they can still have a career. This is where they can still have a future. And even beyond this, they will be doing other work in their communities. And lastly, is the commitment to funding. And simply said, I think as we can all understand, it does take money to sustain and to maintain programs that provide this kind of support. So thank you for that. Can I jump in? Because I'm just so inspired. And <laughs> I think, Carlos, what you're talking about is it's so much in alignment with the kinds of things that I share with instructors when I'm telling them about like how to be more inclusive in your classroom. It's it's recognizing that learners are human beings and that learning doesn't stop or start when someone comes into that lecture or tutorial and it doesn't end when they leave. And so that notion of wraparound supports just really resonated with me because I think about, you know, someone can't learn if they're hungry or if they're dealing with mental health or housing issues. And, you know, somebody can't learn if when they go home on the bus, they encounter racism and racist remarks like that. And so understanding learners as, as holistic humans who have all of these parts and thinking about how all of those supports that you mentioned are just as important to a student's learning as what an instructor might do. I mean, not to diminish the role of the instructor, of course, but you know, I think one thing that I'm really excited about with the EDIA programming we're developing is that it's recognizing everyone at the U of M has a role to play in people's learning and everyone has more to learn no matter what their role. And so that kind of notion of everybody can be a part of supporting that student learning is, is really something that's standing out to me from what you were saying. So thank you for that. I don't know if I can add in um, a bit. I think Robin, when you mentioned about that, you cannot learn when you're hungry, you cannot learn when you're having mental issues. It brought to mind doing orientations uh, when a lot of the international students, so um, 
a special case is Naomi will call me up and say, do you want to tell the student how you manage with your kids? And it is something that a lot of them would want to get that kind of assurance that there are care homes, there are daycares, there are, you give them that long list. So I talk about it to them and you can see that sense of relaxation, right? When they know that, okay, I can sort my kids out and study. So they are there, but physically mentally their minds are everywhere because they want to address address certain issues so they can ease in and start studying yeah thanks for raising that Ravi. yeah well thank you carlos and also robin and, and Ogadima. i think you've all shared in one way or the other how to break down barriers and how to make education equitable right and equitable in a way that providing the support to each individual that they need, holistic support. And I hear you, Carlos, it's not easy, right? It is. It requires sometimes quite some effort, but I also know, and maybe we get to that later, that it can make a difference because I've seen um, access students succeed. I have seen professionals in my work environment who, who tell me very proudly that they've been part of the access program. And that shows to me also the power of education and why we need equitable access to education because education can also be the means to get through a difficult time in your life if you have the holistic support right and um, that that is something we need as a society because we need people with this real life experience and education and who, who can really then walk the life authentically but I don't want to engage too much on the panel. That's not my, not my job. My job is to um, have another question for Vicky. Um, because speaking of how do we do this, you are an instructor. You're interacting with the students very regularly. So can you share what are some practical approaches that you apply to support equity, diversity, and inclusion? Sure. So um, again, my workshops that I do um, encompass the whole year that the international students are with us. And luckily I'm able to adapt them as our needs have changed. One of the first ways we changed was after COVID to deliver when we delivered the workshop. So we now have an in-person option, uh, online option that's recorded. So it, people can access that when it's suitable for them. It's not one of their certificate courses. So we have some freedom there. Now we start um, incorporating some of these ideas right at, from our orientation where we do invite our elder in residence and uh, he speaks to our students then and he encourages them all that although they're joining the U of M and extended ed community that he really encourages them to um, you know, eat their food and speak their language and sing their songs and to bring their culture the best way to adapt to this culture here is to bring theirs. And that's something that I've taken to heart as well as far as being able to explore my own culture to be able to share that. Um, when we get into uh, school uh, things starting and my workshops, we start with academic integrity, which is an area I work uh, a lot in. So that has gone from not only the education piece of academic integrity to um, I'm also part of the discipline process and to listening to the students uh, situations that led them to sometimes committing academic integrity uh, or academic misconduct quite often is uh, uh, mental health issues, uh, isolation, depression, um, a lot of issues that aren't in the typical things that we would teach, but we do, I do have a workshop called Setting Up for Success, our second workshop of the year, where that one adapts so quickly because what students need to be successful in the term changes so much. So things that have been added have included, you know, paying attention to pronouns and signatures and what is inclusive language and how can we work towards that. Um, also, um, experiential learning, trying to add that into the workshops, because something that um, working with Wambadi, he's taught me when I ask him about learning outcomes, he says, you can't plan how you're going to make people feel. And so we, I just, you know, I've added a few things into workshops where rather than give a list of mental health tips, we will actually meditate, so do a focused uh, guided meditation for 10 minutes. And there's some awkward laughing at the beginning, but by the end, we have a really relaxed group of students. And... Um, we also do a 10 minute desk stretch and many of the students report that that's the first time that they have felt relaxed since they arrived in Canada. This is probably three or four weeks into their time here when we do that workshop. And that has had the best response I've ever had in any workshop ever. 
So the experiencing of um, reduction in stress was way more effective than just telling them, make sure you reduce your stress. It's going to have an impact on your uh, coursework. Um, so that's been a big thing. And so now I'm looking for more and more opportunities to include that experiential learning with our students. Um, one way um, I've been able to apply for funding through the Extended Education Endowment Fund for several uh, initiatives, the first one being Academic Integrity Night. And that's a night, uh, an event that the Academic Integrity Coordinator and I put on. We're coming up on our third um, just in a couple of weeks, actually in coordination with the International Day of Academic Integrity, where the theme this year is um, it's everybody, all hands on deck, it, everybody's voices are important. So we'll be including um, looking for student voices specifically for this, for in this regards to academic integrity for this event. And that's been included into our budget. So we know that we can incorporate this event that's meant to talk about academic integrity in a different way. That's not scary, uh, you know, intimidating, something that will build community. We have food, um, it's a more relaxed environment, and that's something that we've been able to um, use our funding for. We've also applied for funding to um, present the box and circle exercise to instructors and extended ed staff. So not just to students, but knowing that the instructors and staff who are um, working with our students to support them get some information as well. Um, the Box and Circle is an experiential exercise meant to teach us about um, Canadian uh, colonial history and the effect it's had on Indigenous people here in Canada. So that's going to be something that we hope will have long-term effects as we continue to change our programming. Um, and sense of belonging is really important from students from all over the world as well. So we try to plan things like meet and greets and different activities where the students can come together. Of course, promoting university uh, uh, U of M uh, events as well. There's so many things that go on. So not only participating in them myself, but also encouraging our students to do that as well has been uh, really effective um, for, our, for our students. Trying to think of Thank you, Vicky. That we're coming up. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. I really like how you really think about every workshop that you set on, how you can support the students, right? And their diverse needs and their needs beyond the classroom. Because I think you're re reinforcing the theme that we heard earlier. It's not just ed ed about academics. Education is really a system. And it needs to take the entire human being and all the human beings in their diversity into account to be effective. And um, that, that goes back to, you know, you need, you need to be in a somewhat relaxed place to, to learn well, right? And so uh, as, as know that you can said, practically help the students. Yeah, as Ogodima said, the, the diversity is built into our classrooms. We have people from all over in every classroom all the time. So then the workshop was developed to, uh, we have a teamwork uh, workshop. So now we talk about um, that diversity can bring conflict and then we do an experiential exercise in that workshop as well to um, focus on active listening and sharing perspectives diplomatically that sort of thing but so we take that and then we'll try to add so as we learn more about EDIA concepts we can add those pieces into each workshop self-awareness um, things like active listening and I'll, i take that on myself as well as the instructor because it's really important that um i'm passing on my learning as well and so that's something i take uh seriously as well is to practice what i preach and even um you know sharing things like we're encouraged to share our personal um perspective on the land acknowledgement as instructors in the class. And so that's something that takes a bit of time to, to do and to feel comfortable doing. But we've also noticed some of our students doing it in their presentations to add the land acknowledgement and their personal spin. So we can see that there, there is an effect. Thank you. And it's, it's wonderful how you move from student lifelong learning to your own lifelong learning as an instructor, which is a necessity for that. So that brings me to a question after Robin, but I want to pause for a moment and also invite all our attendees to uh, share their questions in, in the chat. Um, we will definitely have some time to answer your questions and we want to include you. So please, uh, please share them. Um, so speaking of lifelong 
learning and the need for all of us to, to continuously learn, especially about equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Robin, you've really been the lead for us. You've helped us to set up brand new programming around EDIA. And the idea is really to empower more people, more instructors, but also staff, student, faculty, to be active and to really promote the futures of education in, in with respect to EDIA. So how do the goals of this new EDIA program align with UNESCO's report on the futures of education? Can you help us go full circle here? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think, you know, I, I have certainly been leading the project, but I want to really give credit to the huge team of folks who have helped at various stages and sometimes through the whole process with, with bringing this forwards because it's been such a journey um, over the last year and a half, I think. Um, so the I think, you know, fundamentally, of course, the EDI programming, which is a standalone course and then a three course micro certificate on different aspects of EDIA addressing different actions, uh, learning opportunities, those sorts of things, self-reflection. Um, it most obviously aligns because uh, the UNESCO report emphasizes equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, and that is a key important component of these courses. Um, but I think those links, for me, they really go beyond just knowledge. You know, I think it's it's important to have those those foundational concepts in mind to understand what what does equity mean instead of equality? What's the difference there? What does accessibility mean beyond physical accessibility? Um, recognizing that all of those terms have a lot of complexity to them is really important. But I think what I really like about the program design is that it emphasizes competency development. So not just knowledge knowledge acquisition, but also developing skills, developing habits of mind um, that really kind of, again, like to come back to this theme of holism, helps people not just to acquire content, but implement it and, and in, you know, integrate it into their lives um, in the present and in the future as well. Um, and I think another key aspect of the program to emphasize is that there's a lot of opportunity for learner choice where we're giving learners their own agency to determine what their needs are, um, to anticipate their own future needs, to think about, you know, where do I want to go with this information, with this program, with this journey? Um, and that really empowers and motivates learners to then take their own actions towards educational futures that better serve society. And, and I think importantly, brings it back into the university context that we're building capacity at the university for doing this important work. And I think, you know, the U of M's commitment to funding this program uh, so that it can be offered at no cost to the learner and that the learners are anyone affiliated with the U of M is really, you know, uh, transformative, has the potential to, to transform the institution and, and is a fantastic example of a workplace and an institution that's investing in the lifelong learning of everyone involved with it, everyone in its community. And I think with that aim, again, of looking towards the future, of anticipating the future, of saying, well, where this is where we are, but where do we want to go? Where do we need to be? How can we change to get there? And recognizing that that change is the responsibility of everyone, whether you're, uh, you know, working working for a physical plant, a first year undergraduate, an extended ed student, you know, the president of the institution, the dean, you know, we're all in there, right? And, and I think it's it's really important to see that as a community effort uh, towards that transformation, which really aligns with this notion in the report of, you know, societal buy-in to this idea of education as a lifelong right, and, you know, and we can all make it happen. So that's that's really exciting as well. And I find it very exciting how in, in our conversation here today, we move from really recognizing the importance of holistically supporting each individual and of where they are and how we can, understanding each other from a cultural competency framework, for example, to transforming an institution, right? Because I think, Robin, what you shared is shows the power of education. It starts and has to be rooted in the individual and in our personal relationships, but it goes further. It goes beyond, it goes to our systems, our institutions and our cultures. And um, that's exactly what we are aiming for. And I, I look forward to seeing what, what we can do in this space and what difference it makes for our learners. And with learners in this case, I mean everybody, right? Our students, our faculty, our staff, and all of us as we have to continue to, life, to do lifelong learning every day. So thank you for really going full circle. <laughs> Um, I'd like to now open up to, to any questions, both from 
um, our HRDs, but also from our panelists through each other. Um, there's many interesting aspects we have heard. So if you have any question, please either post it in the chat, I will read it, or in my panel, speak up. Well, my question as an instructor to Ogadima as the student is what, um, as futures of education, where do you see uh, extended as the most important next step? Um, what's missing? Where could we improve? Thanks, Vicky, for that question. And to me, uh, the first uh, reality, if I'm using myself as a case study here. So the first reality that hits international student uh, hard as they arrive is not just to change the wide change in temperature, not just, um, yeah, the frosty environment you're seeing, but also adapting to the wide spectrum of diverse people and cultural difference. I mean, people are coming from all over the world and you are leaving your, your comfort zone into this new environment. So that is the first shock that hits everyone that comes in, international students per se. So I remember walking into the orientation hall and I could sense the tension on the faces of the diverse international student. And understandably, you know, this is as a result of uncertainties and anxieties, you know, in these new environments that they are in and what the future holds for them, right? So that is understandable that that tension is there. But then I, I look around and there was the um, teachers and the organizers of the orientation and they greeted us with this the warmest smiles you can ever think of and that alone gives us this assurance calms our fears kind of and makes us feel that everything is going to be all right and not just it made us feel that, but they said that it's going to be okay. You want this. And it's like, what do you want? What is your concern? And so I love that. I, I love that practice, that warm smile. It is something I would want um, extended aid to. I would want to encourage extended aid to continue. That warm smile from the teachers and from the organizers of that orientation it just, that first impression matters. It instilled in me a positive attitude to prepare me for what is going to come. I, feel, I felt like, yes, I'm going to have a great experience. It gave me that assurance. I mean, so uh, it, it gave you that comfort that you're in good hands, right? And it calms down all our fears. So since the first time I attended the orientation, I remember subsequent orientation, I wanted to be there because I wanted to give that warm smile to the new ones coming in. I wanted to be the one giving them that assurance that it's going to be okay. I wanted to answer all their diverse questions. And after the orientation, I do get floods of calls and text messages from all of them. Yes, you said this. Yes, did you say this? And I was so happy to do that. And I appreciate what the teacher are doing in that regards and please it should be encouraged yeah that is my perspective as a student coming in first time <laughs> thank you Ogadima and as a teacher myself I, you remind me how important that first impression is whether or not somebody feels that they are welcome and for yeah. us I think as teachers educators instructors it really means prepare for that think about it right all the things Vicky shared plan those first five moments so that there is the big smile or that there is this interactive moment. Because if you miss that first impression, it gets really, really difficult, right? Yeah. So we should all be putting our best teaching efforts into that first, first moment. And I'm sure Robin has lots of thought on that as well. <laughs> well, I'm thinking- Any other too, questions? I, I was thinking, actually, sort of, you called me out, so I felt like compelled to jump in, but I was thinking about, there's a question in the Q&A about learners, uh, particularly when they first start a program, needing help with things like academic writing requirements or Microsoft Office and how to use it, and sort of these extra skills that are needed to learn, but are not necessarily part of, you know, psychology 100 or music theory 101, whatever the first courses that they take are. And, and it just makes me think again of, of that importance of, of just recognizing that we're teaching all sorts of things. We're teaching 
not just whatever the content is specifically, but it's like preparing for that bigger notion of, okay, right. I told them to, that they had to submit this on UM Learn, but did I teach them how to use UM Learn? And recognizing that that does need to be a part of what we're all doing as educators is, is kind of looking for those hidden skills, um, uncovering them, figuring out, you know, maybe it's as a group planning and saying, hey, you know, as a department, we're looking for this, or as a unit, we need to ensure that everyone uh, gets these things and not seeing them as remedial or deficiencies, but rather as, well, this is something that's part of learning about this. So if you don't have that already, then let's make sure you've got it. And then if you do have it, let's, you know, add to that. Let's add some new ideas. So um, I think it really connected for me between those two concepts. And thank you, Robin, for drawing our attentions to the questions in the Q&A there. More coming in now, which I really appreciate. Um, so I, I see the inspiration there. I see that we haven't answered all students, uh, all questions in the Q&A. But what I want to share with our attendees, we, we are seeing them. And what we will do is we will respond to them after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and it will also be posted. And we'll make sure that we have some responses to your questions because they're important. In the end of the day, as we learn together today, we learn from each other, with each other, we inspire each other, and we need to see each other. And so please know you have been seen. And um, thinking about post-secondary culture organization, holistic approach, orientation, and how to bring it all together are exactly the type of questions we're excited to see all of us thinking about, both within the panel as well as online. Um, so I'd like to conclude then for today with a, with a quote from UNESCO's report on the futures of education. According to UNESCO, education has the most transformational potential to shape just and sustainable futures. And I appreciate all of you, the attendees and panelists, on working together to achieve this tremendous potential of the futures of education. Um, I need to share a few thank yous. I want to thank in particular my wonderful colleague, Dr. Kari Kuma, Associate Dean, who is not on the panel, but who has worked very wonderfully behind the scenes with me and developing the concepts for this webinar. I want to thank Karen Woloszuk for nicely guiding us through the um, panel today and her team for all the technical support. We wouldn't be able to do this without you because that's all the expertise we are frankly missing. Um, and I want to thank in particular my co-panelists, Ogadima, Carlos, Vicky, and Robin. Thank you for the interesting conversation, for all your tremendous thoughts on how to support learners, how to create equitable and inclusive educational spaces and how to really use education systems for the future and for lifelong learning. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Karen? Thanks, Uta. Yeah, thanks so much, Uta. Um, and I would just like to add my thanks to Uta, yourself and, and our panel. I feel like your knowledge, your experiences and ideas really helped us understand how to create a more inclusive and equitable learning environment. It was a great conversation today. On behalf of the Division of Extended Education, I want to express our gratitude to all our webinar participants for joining us today. You'll receive a short survey immediately after the webinar. And if you can respond to that, we'd really appreciate it as that helps us to improve and tailor our future events. And as Uta mentioned, please check back on the Extended Education website for answers to the questions that we didn't get today. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.